Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is the fifth and last part of chapter one, Unity of the Doctrine. The recent publication of the 1844 manuscript in the German ideology has thrown a new, a new light on the formation and objectives of Marxian thought. The texts in question did not reveal Marx's humanism, which was already known from the Holy Family, the Jewish question, and the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. But they do show how the development of his ideas, his economic theory, did not destroy his concrete humanism, but made it richer and explicit. Dialectical materialism was formed and developed dialectically. Marxian thought began from Hegel's logic and first of all denied this logic in the name of materialism, that is, of a consequent empiricism. The discovery of the natural, material, man of flesh and blood was the first moment of this development. It seemed incompatible with Hegel's idea and with his absolute method, which constructs its own abstract object. And yet this humanism went further than the materialism of the 18th century, which had been based on the early results of the natural sciences. It implied Hegel's theory of alienation and gave alienation a decisive scope, attributing to it both a good and a bad side and determining it as a creative process. In the 1844 manuscript, the theory of alienation is still closer to Hegelian rationalism than to Feuerbach's naturalism. However, it demands that speculative philosophy be transcended in the name of action and practice. Practice is seen as both a beginning and an end, and as the origin of all thought and the source of every solution, as a fundamental relation of the living man to nature and to his own nature. The critical investigation into economics, whose importance Engels was the first to notice, then comes to be naturally integrated with humanism as being an, anal an analysis of the social practice that is of men's concrete relations with each other and with nature. The most pressing human problems are determined as economic problems, calling for practical, that is for political solutions, politics being the supreme instance of the social practice, the only means of acting consciously on social relations. As this humanism becomes more profound, it next reveals the dialectical elements it had contained a dialectic of historical contradictions and the economic categories, a dialectic of reification or alienation. Historical materialism, inasmuch as, as it is a science of economics, integrates the dialectical method with itself and, raised thereby to a higher level, appears as, as an application of the general method, the scientific dialectic, to a specific field. After having been denied by Marx, the dialectic joins up again with a more profound materialism. It has itself been freed from its momentary and congealed form, Hegelianism. It has ceased to be the absolute method, independent of the object, and has become the scientific method of exploration and exposition of the object. It discovers its truth by being united with the actual content. In other words, A, the materialist dialectic accords the primacy explicitly to the content. The primacy of the content over the form is, however, only one definition of materialism. Materialism asserts essentially that being discovered and experienced as content without our aspiring to define it a priori and exhaust it determines thought. B. The materialist dialectic is an analysis of the movement of this content and a reconstruction of the total movement. It is thus a method of analysis for each degree and for each concrete totality, for each original historical situation. At the same time, it is a synthetic method that sets itself the task of, compre oops, of comprehending the total movement. It does not lead to axioms, constancies, or permanencies, or to mere analogies, but to laws of development. C. Thus understood, the dialectical method therefore constructs the historical and sociological object, 
while locating and determining its specific objectivity. A brute objectivity of history would be inaccessible, transcendent to the individual mind, the concept and discourse. It would be overwhelming and inexorable in character, allowing itself to be described indefinitely, but without our being able to glimpse any explanatory analysis or effectiveness in it. Conversely, without an object and without objectivity, there is no science. Every historical or sociological theory which sets out to be a science must establish the reality of its object and define the method which enables it to approach this object. Dialectical materialism satisfies this double requirement of the scientific mind. It establishes the economic objectivity without hypostasizing it. It locates the objective reality of history but straightaway transcends it as being a reality independent of men. It thus introduces living men, actions, self-interest, aims, unselfishness, events, and chances into, into the texture and intelligible structure of the becoming. It analyzes a totality that is coherent yet many-sided and dramatic. Is not dialectical materialism therefore both a science and a philosophy, a causal analysis and a worldview, a form of knowledge and an attitude to life, a becoming aware of the given world and a will to transform this world, without any of these characteristics excluding the other? The movement and inner content of Hegel's dialectic between rationalism and idealism, that is, are taken up again in dialectical materialism which, in one sense, is more Hegelian than Hegelianism. A plurality of different and perhaps even incompatible meanings of the dialectic survived in the speculative dialectic. The dialectic as a method of analysis of the content excluded the dialectic as a priori construct, and these two meanings did not fit in very well with the theory of alienation. By positing a total, a priori object, absolute knowledge, the system, Hegel went against the content, against the becoming, against living subjectivity and negativity. Dialectical materialism restores the inner unity of dialectical thought. It dissolves the static determinations attributed by Hegel to the idea, to knowledge, to religion, and to the state. It rejects any speculative construct, any metaphysical synthesis. Thus, the different meanings of the dialectic become not only compatible, but complementary. The dialectical method epitomizes the investigation of the historical development. It is the highest consciousness which living man can have of his own formation, development, and vital content. Categories and concepts are elaborations of the actual content, abbreviations of the infinite mass of particularities of concrete existence. The method is thus the expression of the becoming in general, and of the universal laws of all development. In themselves, these laws are abstract, but they can be found in specific forms in all concrete contents. The method begins from the logical sequence of fundamental categories, a sequence by virtue of which we can recover the becoming, of which they are the abridged expression. This method permits the analysis of particularities and specific situations, of the original concrete contents in the various spheres. It becomes the method that will guide the transformation of a world in which the form, economic, social, political, or ideological, is not adequate to the content, to man's actual and potential power over nature and his own artifacts, but enters into contradiction with it. The, the third term is therefore the practical solution to the problems posed by life to the conflicts and contradictions to which the praxis gives birth and which are experienced practically. The transcending is located within the movement of action, not in the pure time scale of the, of the philosophical mind. Wherever there is a conflict, there may, but it is not inevitable, appear a solution which transforms the opposed terms and puts an end to the conflict by transcending them. It is up to the analysis to determine this solution, up to experience to release it, and up to action to realize it. Sometimes there is no solution, no social group was capable of putting an end to the economico-political contradictions of the Roman world in its decadence. The relation between the 
contradictories ceases therefore to be a static one, defined logically and then found again in things, or negated in the name of a transcendent absolute. It becomes a living relation, experienced in existence. Several of Hegel's illustrations of the reciprocal determination of contradictories, um, summum jus, summa injuria, the way east is also the way west, etc., become insufficient. The opposed terms are energies or acts. The unity of the contradictories is not only an in interpenetration of concepts, an internal scission, it is also a struggle, a dramatic relation between energies which are only by virtue of one another and cannot exist except one against the other. Thus master and slave, or if one prefers, the, the different species of animals, this struggle is a tragic relation in which the contradictories are produced and support one another mutually until either one of them triumphs and they are transcended or else they destroy each other. Taken in all its objectivity, the contradiction is fluid and the logical relation is only its abstract expression. The transcending is action in life. The victory of one of the two forces which overcomes the other by transforming it transforming itself and raising the content to a higher level. The problem of man, or more precisely, the problem of modern society, of the social mystery and its transcending, is central for dialectical materialism, which has appeared in this society as its appointed hour, as a scientific expression of its reality, its multiform contradictions and the potentialities it contains. However, in order to elucidate modern industrial society, the analysis must go back to older societies. These it determines in their relation to the concrete totality as given today, in as much as they are original totalities that have been transcended, that is in the only historical reality that we can conceive of or determine. In the past, this analysis finds under, special, under specific forms certain relations such as that between master and slave, for example, which Marx called the exploitation of man by man, or else typical modes of thought or social existence, such as fetishism. Dialectical materialism's field cannot therefore be restricted to the present day. It extends over the whole of sociology. But nature itself exists for us only as a content, an experience, and human practice. The dialectical analysis is valid for any content. It expresses the connection between the elements or moments of all becoming by incorporating the experimental sciences, physical, biological, etc., and using them to verify itself. It can therefore discover, even in nature, quality and quantity, quantity turning into quality, reciprocal actions, polarities and discontinuities, the complex but still analyzable becoming. The sciences of nature are specific. They recognize and study as such natural, physical, biological, etc., polarities or oppositions. They use the concept as a trick in order to study and modify qualities through the mediation of quantities, but they are never able to overcome these oppositions. Social science, on the other hand, examines the oppositions so as to overcome them. The sciences of nature and the social sciences are specifically creative, each of them having its own method and objectives. However, the laws of the human reality cannot be entirely different from the laws of nature. The dialectical chain of fundamental categories may therefore have a universal truth. It was only with great caution that Marx embarked on this path, as in his application of the dialectical method to economics. However, capital shows how, in Marxian thought, the concrete dialectic is extended to nature, an extension carried on by angles in dialectics of nature. Their correspondence at this period shows that Marx followed Engels' endeavor closely and approved of it. Thus, dialectical materialism is made universal and acquires the full dimensions of a philosophy. It becomes a general conception of the world. A Walton Shang, 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 and hence a renewal of philosophy. For the materialist dialectician, 
Universal interdependence is not a formless tangle, a chaos without structure. It is only the decline of speculative thought since Hegel that is that has dissociated the determinations and devalued the structural elements of the becoming. Quantity, discontinuity, relative nothingness. Dialectical materialism rescues the human mind from falling back into confusion and one-sidedness. The totality of the world, the infinite finite, the infinite finite of nature, has a determinable structure, and its movement can become intelligible for us without our having to attribute it to organizing intelligence. Is order and structure emerge from reciprocal action, from the complex, from the complex of conflicts and solutions, destructions and creations, transcendings and eliminations, chances and necessities? revolutions and involutions. Order emerges from the becoming. The structure of the movement is not distinct from the movement. Relative disorders prepare a new order and make it manifest. All reality is a totality, both one and many, scattered or coherent and open to its future, that is, to its end. Between moments, there cannot exist either a purely external finality or a purely internal one, either a harmony or mechanical collisions. Being elements of a, tot of a totality, having been transcended and maintained within it, limited by each other and yet reciprocally determined, they are the ends one of another. There exist ends without finality. Each moment contains other moments, aspects, or elements that have come from its past. Reality thus overflows the mind, obliging us to delve ever deeper into it, and especially to be ever revising our principles of identity, causality, and finality, and making them more thorough. Being determines our consciousness of being, and the being of our thought determines our reflection on our thought. The reality is nature, a given content, yet one that can be apprehended in its infinite richness by the mind which moves forward based on the praxis and becomes more and more penetrating and supple, tending as if, it, tending as if towards a mathematical limit to which we are forever drawing nearer but have never reached, towards absolute knowledge or the idea. The dialectic, far from being an inner movement of the mind, is real. It precedes the mind in being. It imposes itself on the mind. First of all, we analyze the simplest and most abstract moments, that of thought that has been stripped as far as possible of all content. In this way, we discover the most general categories and how they are linked together. Next, this movement must be connected up with the concrete movement, with the given content. We then become aware of the fact that the movement of the content, or of being, is made clear for us in the laws of the dialectic. The contradictions in thought do not come simply from thought itself, from its ultimate incoherence or impotence. They also come from the content. Linked together, they tend towards the expression of the total movement of the content and raise it to the level of consciousness and reflection. Our quest for knowledge cannot be thought of as having been terminated by dialectical logic. Quite the reverse, it must acquire a fresh impetus from it. The dialectic, a movement of thought, is true only in a mind that is in motion, in the form of a general theory of the becoming and its laws, or of a theory of knowledge, or of concrete logic. Dialectical materialism can only be an instrument of research and action, never a dogma. It does not define, it locates the two elements of human existence, being and consciousness. It places them in order. Being, nature, has priority. The consciousness comes first for man. Whatever has appeared in time can be erected by man and for man into a superior value. Nor, as a doctrine, can dialectical materialism be enclosed within an exhaustive definition. It is defined negatively by being opposed to those doctrines which limit human existence, either from without or within, by subordinating subordinating it to some external existence or else by reducing it to a one-sided element or partial experience seen as being privileged and definitive. 
Dialectical materialism asserts that the equalization of thought and being cannot be reduced to an idea, but must be achieved concretely, that is in life, as the concrete power of the mind over being. Dialectical thinking has never ceased to evolve, nor new aspects of it to appear, both in the lifetime and the writings of Marx and Engels, and since. Every truth is relative to a certain stage of the analysis and of thought, to a certain social content. It preserves its truth only by being transcended. We must go on constantly deepening our awareness of the content and extending the content itself. In the past, as in the present, our knowledge has been limited by the limitation of the content and of the social form. Every doctrine, and this includes dialectical materialism, stems from this limitation, which is not that of the human mind in general, but the limitation of man's present state. It is at the precise moment when it becomes aware of its own dialectical nature that thought must distinguish with the utmost care what in the dialectical movement of ideas comes from the actual content and what from the present form of thought. The exposition of dialectical materialism does not pretend to put an end to the forward march of knowledge or offer a, close, a closed totality of which all previous systems had been no more than the inadequate expression. However, with our modern awareness of human potential and of the problem of man, the limitation of thought changes in character. No expression of dialectical materialism can be definitive, but instead of being incompatible and conflicting with each other, it may perhaps be possible for these expressions to be integrated into an open totality, perpetually in the process of being transcended. Precisely in so far as they will be expressing the solutions to the problems facing concrete man. For man, the relation of particular, uh, sorry, for man, the relation of a particular reality to the total movement takes the form of a problem. There is a problem whenever the becoming carries thought and activity along and orientates them by forcing them to take account of new elements. At the moment when the solution is tending, so to speak to enter into reality and demanding the consciousness and the action which can realize it. It is in this sense that humanity only sets itself problems it is capable of solving. The resolution of contradictions in the transcending thus takes on its full practical significance. The solution, the third term, is not an attitude of the mind. There's no substitute for practical contact with things or effective cooperation with the demands and movements of the content. In human terms, the energy of creation is extended and made manifest in and through the praxis. That is the total activity of mankind, action and thought, physical labor and knowledge. The praxis is doubly creative in its contact with realities, hence in knowledge and in invention or discovery. Dialectical materialism seeks to transcend the doctrines which reduce the mind's activity to becoming acquainted with what has already been achieved, or which recommend it to hurl itself into the void of mystical exploration. Experience and reason, intelligence and intuition, knowing and creating, conflict with one another only if we take a one or conflict with one another only if we take a one sided view of them. The praxis is where dialectical materialism both starts and finishes. The word itself denotes, in philosophical terms, what common sense refers to as real life, that life which is at once more prosaic and more dramatic than that of the speculative intellect. Dialectical materialism's aim is nothing less than the rational expression of the praxis, of the actual content of life, and, correlatively, the transformation of the present praxis into a social practice that is conscious, coherent, and free. Its theoretical aim and its practical aim, knowledge and creative action cannot be separated. In Hegel, the inferior moments had coexisted with the superior ones in the eternity of the idea and the system. In this way, time, history, and freedom had become unreal again, having allowed themselves to be arranged into a schema that included all the established forms of life uh, of law, of customs, and of consciousness. In dialectical materialism, negativity is more profoundly positive and dynamic in character. The third term, the triumphant outcome of a 
conflict transforms the content of the contradiction by reassuming it. It lacks the conservative sol solemnity of the Hegelian synthesis. Only in this way can there be a real movement, a dramatic history in action, creation and development, liberation and liberty. The rectilinear schema of the becoming is too simple. Hegel's triangular one too mechanical. In dialectical materialism, the static representation of time is replaced by a vital and directly experienced notion of succession, of the action which eliminates and creates. Man can thus perfectly rationally set himself an objective which is both a transcending and a coming to fruition. In Hegel, finally, the idea and the mind appear to produce themselves only because they are already because they already are. History comes to look like a bad joke. At the end of the becoming, all we find is the spiritual principle of the becoming, which is thus only a repetition, an absurd illusion. The ordeal and misfortunes of consciousness have a ritual, magic action, which causes absolute mind to descend among us, amongst us. But this Hegelian mind always remains oddly narcissistic and solitary. In its contemplation of itself, it obscures the living beings and dramatic movement of the world. According to dialectical materialism, men can and must set themselves a total solution. Man does not exist in advance, metaphysically. The game has not already been won. Men may lose everything. The transcending is never inevitable, but it is for this precise reason that the question man the question man and of mind acquires an infinite tragic significance and that those who can sense this will give up their solitude in order to enter into an authentic spiritual community.